In his commentary on the book of Revelation, James Montgomery Boyce observes, in light of Jesus' teaching, what is surprising is not that Christians have been persecuted and killed all through the long annals of human history, but that so many have not been. Open Doors, an organization ministering to persecuted Christians, estimated 365 million Christians worldwide endured persecution in 2023. Along with that, they estimate that over 5,000 Christians were killed for their faith last year. If you're looking for something to pray for, roughly 90% of those killings occurred in the country of Nigeria at the hands of the radical Islamic group Boko Haram. Again, these statistics should drive us to pray and to the extent that we can to advocate for our Christian brothers and sisters. And yet, despite the horrendous reality, Boyce's observation is a fair one. In Matthew 24, Jesus promised, Then you will be handed over to, the, to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. There's a sense where persecution is the expected experience for all Christians, not as we've come to assume the exceptionally poor plight of a few. And we're continuing where we left off last week with the opening of the fifth seal and the souls underneath the altar. We talked about their faithfulness and obedience to Jesus, following his example, being slain as he was slain. The reason is that they were witnesses. In Greek, the word for witness is a martyr, and martyrs they were. If verse 9 tells us of the cause, verse 10 is their cry. Like Abel's blood crying out from the ground in Genesis 4, these souls cry out from under the altar. John tells us they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. I have to admit it, I find this passage confounding. In Acts, when Stephen was being stoned, he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. A detail Luke no doubt includes to demonstrate Stephen's continuity with Jesus' own example, who on the cross prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Are you confused? Those under the altar were like the sun in their willingness to be slain, and yet here are they unlike the sun in withholding forgiveness. One would think that being under the altar in such proximity to the Father and to the Son that any desire to avenge would have disappeared. And yet it hasn't. It, it's still present. My only explanation is the circumstance of first century Christian persecution. John's apocalypse was given to them not as a prediction of something that would happen thousands of years in the future. It had to speak pastorally, given the full weight and to account for the horrors that they faced of being sewn into animal skins and fed to wild animals, being burned as human torches to light the garden parties of Nero. So here's the question. Are, are those under the altar still clinging to the hope of payback? Is that what's going on? I don't think so. God is gracious, and the image of the lamb that was slain is essential to our understanding of revelation. But don't mishear me, God is just. Eugene Peterson has suggested that no other community of people has insisted so consistently through the centuries on calling evil by its right name. Their cry is not for revenge, but God, that God's just reign would come. They do not demand their own satisfaction, but they look forward to the triumph of God's justice. One commentator I read said this, The martyrs are not content simply to go to heaven. It is the earth they want, a redeemed creation in which God's goodness and justice prevail. They are in heaven and yet long to see earth redeemed. 
So many of us are on earth and care not for it, but only long for heaven. May we be those who pray on earth that God's will be done on earth, that his justice come and align our lives such that that prayer may be manifest in and through us. Have a blessed week.